Today we have a very different kind of podcast. Today I am the guest on the Bregman Leadership Podcast, Peter Bregman. I'm here with Howie Jacobson, my very, very good friend and very accomplished author and professional in his own right. And he is going to be interviewing me, or we're at least going to be having a conversation about my most recent book that is out now called Leading with Emotional Courage. This is the galley that both he and I have. Uh, it's the uncorrected proof uh, because we're recording this a few weeks before the book is actually available. Uh, Leading with Emotional Courage, How to Have Hard Conversations, Create Accountability, and Inspire Action on Your Most Important Work. Uh, what I want to say is this is my most important work. Uh, this book really culminates uh, uh, some some big work that I've been playing with over the past uh, decade, really, and it feels like my most important work. So I'm really, really excited that we're finally at the place where it's it's getting out into people's hands, and uh, and I'm really excited to talk about it. So, uh, Howie, thank you for having me on the Bregman Leadership Podcast. <laughs> yeah, it's a great it's a great honor to uh, be your interlocutor today. So. <laughs> I realize we, we've known each other for about two decades now, and so I have witnessed firsthand your ride towards this book. And I've, you know, and I can see, looking back, you know, ten year ago conversations that uh, I see in the book, and fifteen, and even twenty years ago, things you were you were interested in. I would love to be able to just tell everybody like how much of you is embodied in this work, and how much courage and passion you've put into it, but I can't. So I'd love for you to just sort of share, like for, from your perspective, what's the origin of, of this book? Why, why this book and why now? Well, you know, there's a couple of questions, uh, a couple of answers to that question. And, it's, and, and you've been a part of this also, which is why this particular kind of conversation makes me excited. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. But, I, you know, probably close to 10 years ago now, I, I went to a week-long workshop at Esalen with this woman named Anne Bradney, who um, became my teacher and is really remarkable in many ways, and the book is in part dedicated to her and Jessica Gelson, and it was Jessica who first said to me, hey, you got to meet this woman, Anne Bradney, and I went out and, and spent a week uh, in this workshop, and and I, I found myself in a situation that, and I hope this doesn't sound arrogant, but that I'm, I'm rarely in, which is we were dealing with psychology and communication and relationships and connections with ourselves and with each other. And, and it was like the Wild West. People were making these choices and how they communicated with each other that was like on the verge of massive conflict. And yet... It, it was exactly what needed to happen in the moment for the relationship, for the conversation, for the work that we were doing to progress to the next level. And I was in this workshop and like watching this happen, like really being kind of clueless. And that's a situation I'm not often in where like this is my area of expertise and I'm watching people make these moves, these sort of communication moves and these moves connecting with each other and, and with things that, that are important to them. And making these moves, and I felt like I didn't know what was happening, but they were all the right moves. And so, like, in that moment, I felt like I've got something really important to learn here. And I started studying uh, the work that really kind of ended up being encapsulated in this book around emotional courage. And I remember a conversation that you and I had, Howie, where we were talking about the challenge of, of, doing, of following through on something or the fear uh, that was preventing us from following through on something. And, and you uh, had mentioned to me that someone had said to you once that what we fear is not really the thing. We fear feeling what we would have to feel if we do the thing, right? I'm, I, don't, I don't fear taking a risk. I fear what I might have to feel if I took the risk and I would fail. Then I'd have to feel failure. And, and that is really at the root of this book. So it, it's, you know, like any book or anything that I create, it's made up of a million moments and conversations and tidbits that you pick up from here and there. But it really started in that workshop and, and it's been continuing for 10 years. Okay. So you could have gone to a, like a jazz improv workshop or something like and, and had the same experience of people kind of doing these wild moves of communication and conflict. Like, and you might have said, well, that was really cool, but it doesn't really affect my work. 
What was it about that experience that made you feel like, I've got to dig into this if I want to be my most effective self as Peter Bregman? Well, because it felt really personal, meaning I felt like I was in that room and I was choosing not to do things or to do things um, that I, I was making choices that weren't necessarily in my best interest or in the best interest of people around me, but they were sort of what I knew. And I realized that I was sort of a, afraid or not fully moving into what was needed in that moment. And I was really interested in what was it that stops me. You know, every book I write, I write about um, something that I struggle with in one form or other, right? That I, 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 I basically feel like it's worth spending, you know, years or decades exploring something when I think it's, it's you know, when it really grabs me and interests me. And that's usually when I hit some kind of a wall that, that I'm not getting past. And so I want to kind of understand that better because ultimately I want to continue to grow and to learn and to expand what I'm capable of. And this was one of those moments. If it was a jazz you know, get together and I could, I could really enjoy the way the musicians are, are engaging and playing with each other, but it doesn't ultimately for me affect my life or limit or, or make me feel like I'm or see how I'm limiting myself. But here in this room, I felt the ways in which I was limiting myself and I felt like there was so much opportunity in getting past that. And I really wanted to learn how. Okay. So, so you see a, a, a pathway for personal development and you took it to a whole other level in terms of really informing the way you work with clients, the way you train associates and coaches. So what, what's, what's the hole in the way that we do things that this fills? Well, so let's talk about the, the context of the book, and that'll answer that question, right? Which is that I, you know, I, I've, I've really spent 30 years of my life focused on leadership and focused on what helps us to be more effective leaders, what helps people work effectively together in terms of, of achieving an aligned objective, something that they all care deeply about and make happen. And uh, I've, I've really, like, I've, I've brought it down to, and this is what I talk about in Leading with Emotional Courage, four elements of leadership, right? To lead effectively. And, and when I say lead, I mean lead myself, lead, lead, you know, like it, it could really just be how I step into the world. It could be how we work together to step into the world. It could be how we all work together to achieve something big. Um, I use the word leadership broadly, and I also like the double entendre of it, right? Which is that I could lead as a leader using emotional courage, or I could lead with emotional courage. Like I could start, my first foot forward could be emotional courage. I could lead with emotional courage. And, and, and the book is really meant to uh, support people in doing one or the other or both. And it's broken up into these four elements of leadership, which is to really lead effectively, to exist, to, to lead an effective life. I need to be confident in myself, connected to others, committed to a larger purpose, and I have to have emotional courage in order to take the risks to do those three things, those other three things. So when I say confident in myself uh, or confident in self, I don't mean this false confidence that reads as arrogance and is actually born of insecurity. Right? I mean a confidence that is a comfort with yourself that actually does not require of you to be better than anybody else because you're not insecure. You don't need to prove yourself. You, you, but you have a deep groundedness and a connection. You know what you're feeling. You know how you're feeling. You know that you believe in yourself. Uh, you're willing to take risks because you know you will survive perfectly well whether or not you succeed or fail at that risk. That's a true confidence in yourself. And in order to move in the world, we need that kind of confidence in ourselves. We also need connection with others, right? There's very little. I just wrote a book. Arguably, you could say that, you know, I'm sitting with my laptop on my chair writing my book and I don't need anyone else to do it. But that couldn't be farther from the truth, right? Like in order to create anything in the world, we're really doing it in concert with other people. And especially if you're leading and you're leading teams, which is where I often, because I play in this world of leadership and organizations, I see where people get in their way, their own way, which is that you need to really be connected to others where you're trusting them and you're trusted by them, right? And that's a skill. It's totally important. And then committed to purpose, well, right? 
yeah. yeah, can I let's 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 break those down into into bite sized. Sure. Um, I'm trying. I'm trying to channel you as an interviewer. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> when your guests get excited about what they're talking about. Oh, good, good. So um, go ahead, break it down. So yeah, I mean the the idea of being confident in yourself as not having to be fantastic or superior or or a hundred you know to get it right a hundred percent of the time. To me, that plays into emotional courage in that you have to be willing to have failures in order to realize that failures aren't the worst thing in the world. Like when I was trying to learn how to ride a unicycle, I was terrible. I was terrified of falling. And it was only by like going to grass and actually practicing falling that I developed the ability to ride the unicycle because falling was a part of it. And so for, for developing your own self-confidence, you have to, it's not that you think you're going to succeed all the time, but that you're going to be okay no matter what. Yeah, you actually realize at a certain point, and this is almost a sort of mythical nirvana enlightened experience, but you, you, you get to a certain point where you realize that um, it's not about success or failure. Like it's really not about success or failure, right? It's about failure fully engaging and throwing yourself into things and some things will succeed and some things won't and they're all informative and we all talk about that we all talk you know like there's there's so much in sports in art in in everything right i mean like i i just went to a baseball game with my son with my 10 year old son and and i was looking at the batting averages with him and kind of trying to explain that like the best baseball players fail 70% of the time to hit the ball, right? You know, and if I'm understanding batting average is right. Um, but it's, it, you know, it, and that's just, that's sort of part of the game. So you, you, but you realize that it's stepping up to bat that makes the biggest difference. And this is true in so many areas. But if we lose ourselves with every failure, and if we, and, and if we fall in love with ourselves at every success, then we've lost ourselves. And it's not about trying to get more successes and trying to stay away from failures, although we end up doing that, right? So we end up charging our ways towards trying to aggregate as many possible successes and shying away from failures, which means we just limit what we're willing to do. But it's really like thinking like a scientist, which is every time you fail, you've learned something. And every time you succeed, you've learned something. And and it's it's all the same. It's like really painting on the same canvas. And it's, it's very hard to even explain. I'm listening to myself speak about it, and it's hard to explain. But, you know, the way leading with emotional courage works, the way this book works, is it's lots of short chapters that, that where there's exercises in every single one. And so it's about following a process and building your muscle so that you show up, whether you succeed or fail, that you throw everything you've got into it, and that you learn whatever you're going to learn from it, but failures or successes don't throw you. People can get thrown by successes just as much as they can get thrown by failures. And the goal is for all of that to be ancillary to what we're really doing, which is like showing up and bringing our all. Great. Do you have an example maybe of an exercise in the part about confidence in yourself that you think might be helpful for people? Yeah, you know, I think it's um, there's there's a couple of different things. So some of it is about trusting that you're going to be okay one way or the other. So creating scenarios where it may not even this is an early stage where it may not even be you failing, but you might experience disappointment, right? And being able to live with that in the same way that you experience excitement. So here's a fun thing to do. Ready? Here's a fun exercise to do. Go to a restaurant, and since I know that you are plant-based, that you would probably give some instruction, like, I don't eat meat, but go to a restaurant and look at the menu, and if you have particular instructions you have to give the waiter, like, I don't eat meat, or I'm kosher, or whatever it is that you want to give, you can give those instructions, and then say, just go ahead and order me an entree and an appetizer, or go ahead and order me three entrees, whatever you want to bring me, just bring me. Right? And people are very caught up with what they eat and they want just what they want and you're paying money and you might get something that you don't want and you might be disappointed or you might be surprised, but it's out of your hands. And you sort of realize how much of life is actually out of your hands. I mean, you could order exactly what you want and have it not taste the way you want it to and you're going to be disappointed. So here you're starting off by saying to the waiter, go ahead and bring me whatever you feel like bringing me. 
and you will feel some anxiety about that. You'll feel some stress. You'll feel some excitement. You'll feel all sorts of things. And breathe and don't lose yourself in it. And then notice, oh, this is what disappointment feels like. This is what excitement feels like. This is what surprise pleasure feels like. This is what uh, anxiety feels you know, like. Whatever, you just feel everything and feel your feet on the ground and feel your breath the whole time. And it's a way of saying all of these emotions are going to be flying through you over the silliest little thing, like a meal in a restaurant and, and you know, 25 bucks or whatever it's going to end up costing you. But you'll feel all of those things and you'll realize you don't lose yourself in the midst of it. And that's just a, like one little way, one little thing that can help you begin to get that feeling of grounding yourself in the face of anything. Mm. And the idea is if you, can, if you can't do that, good luck doing it in a performance review or a strategy offsite or uh, a talk you have to give. Exactly, exactly. And then, and once you have done it, the, the converse is, once you've done it there, you realize it's actually not that different than a performance review or a talk that you're going to give. Like there's different consequences, but even the consequences are not that different because it's all about how we end up feeling in the end. All of life is about how we end up feeling in the end. Mm -hmm. And, okay, so the second one is about connecting with with other people, and I think you you have some some uh, examples in the book of people who are very good at one or the other at connecting with themselves, but they're uh, disconnected from others, or they're incredibly connected with others. And I'm guessing a lot of the people who who follow you are sort of coaching slash HR slash caretakers, and you know, so I see myself in that that I could lose myself while taking care of others. How do you, um, how does emotional courage help you balance those two? Yeah. So, I mean, it's a great point you're making and it goes with commitment to purpose. So one of the points that I think is really important is that each of these elements, while they stand alone, are insufficient alone. Mm. Meaning in order to be an effective leader, in order to lead yourself even effectively, you need to be confident in yourself, connected to others and committed to purpose simultaneously. Right? So for those, and, and you will recognize, you're talking about caretakers. And by the way, it's not just HR or coaching professionals. It's leaders who can be so caretaking that they give up themselves in the service of other people. And it might be in the service of their board or their own boss, or it might be in the service of their employees, um, or it might be in service in, of their clients. But it's, it's giving yourself up, right, in order to meet the needs of others. And, and that's, that's the recipe for burnout. And it's a recipe for frustration. And the other is also true, which is it could be all about you and you're not factoring anyone else in. And then you end up kind of alone and feeling betrayed because where has everybody gone and why aren't they supporting me when really you, you know, have failed to effectively connect with them. And I also know a lot of leaders who are so committed to purpose. They care so much about the ultimate outcome that they're trying to achieve that they give themselves up and their teams up and everybody else in pursuit of it. And then everybody leaves feeling frustrated and disengaged and disempowered. And so you really need all three of those simultaneously. And so, you know, one of the things that you see with people when they're connected to other people, which is your question, connected to other people and then and giving up themselves is, you know, they end up really giving themselves a way to saying yes too much, trying to please the people around them and make everybody else happy, but finding that they're depleted at the end of the day because they've actually done nothing to make themselves happy. Gotcha. All right, so we've got the three, the first three C's, and your, your thesis is that all three of those require emotional courage to, to fulfill. Can you talk about how that works? Yeah, so emotional courage, I don't know that we've even defined emotional courage yet, but emotional courage is the willingness to feel everything, right? And I say this in the book, and, and I say it a lot, if you are willing to feel everything, you can do anything. Right? So if I'm willing to feel shame or embarrassment or disappointment, if I'm willing to feel joy and excitement, if I'm willing to feel failure, if I'm willing to feel all of that, then nothing stops me from acting in the world. And so if confidence in self, connection to others, and commitment to purpose allows us to be really successful and powerful in the world, right? emotional courage allows us 
to be confident and to build our confidence in ourselves and our connection to others and commitment to purpose. So if you think about it, it's a huge risk to be confident in myself. To trust myself to do something means that I'm going to take some risks and I may end up being disappointed in myself. And that's the worst kind of disappointment. And it's why so many people end up circumscribing themselves. They end up being smaller than they need to be because they're afraid of disappointing themselves. They're afraid of reaching too high and not achieving what it is that they want to achieve. And so they end up limiting themselves and, and trusting yourself. And it takes emotional courage. You have to be willing to feel that momentary disappointment in order to flex your muscles and grow. Same thing with connection to others. It's a huge risk for people often to connect with other people. To, to actually go to somebody and say, I like you. I appreciate you. Right? Mm -hmm. To go to someone and say, hey, look, I'm really committed to making this work, but I'm having a very hard time with the way you're acting with me and I'm acting with you and I want to work on it. I mean, the ways in which we connect with others is very scary, right? It takes an amazing amount of emotional courage because I might be inviting passive aggressive return. I might say to you, you know, I think we have, uh, you know, an issue that I really want to resolve. And you can look back at me and we go, oh, we don't have an issue. I don't have an issue. It's your problem. And then I'll sit there and I'll feel awkward and I'll feel dumb and I'll feel like, you know, that's not true, but I don't really know what to do with it next. And then I'll go off and I'll gossip and I'll talk about you behind you. And none of that is productive and none of it is helpful. So we need tremendous emotional courage to show up in a way that makes ourselves available to connect with others, even if they don't connect back with us. It's huge. But if we are so worried that someone might not connect back with us, then we'll never reach out and connect with them. And that is a recipe for loneliness, right? It's also a recipe for falling short of what you can accomplish when you bring a group of people together and you want to all work together towards a common purpose, right? Which is the, the commitment to purpose. It's the larger one, which is that we need to work together in alignment. We go into organizations all the time. I see this all the time in organizations where everyone's working on, they're individually productive and they're working on all sorts of different things, but collectively they're not moving forward. So there's a real art to collectively getting a group of people all moving, inspiring a group of people to move towards what's most important. There's an art to that. And, and I can lose myself in that, I can lose others in that, or I can do all three. I could take the, um, have the emotional courage, the willingness to feel what it feels like, to stand for something important, to connect with you and listen to you and bring you on board and to stay connected to myself as I do it all. And all of that takes emotional courage. But when we do that, we are unstoppable. So I realize part of me is thinking about emotional courage as a binary, right? Like you either have it or you don't. And I think what what the book really does is it shows you this is like your you know your gym manual for working out your emo, working out and getting your emotional courage muscles stronger. So if someone's feeling like, well, I could never feel that, there's always there's always a place to begin, right? To 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 start expanding what you are able to feel, even if you know you're not going to go to uh, you know DefCon Seven on day one. Yeah, you know we learn to limit ourselves. We, we aren't born limited. Like we're actually born with a natural curiosity and a willingness to take risk, but we don't even really know it's risk because we haven't had our hands slapped yet. And then when we start to get this sort of social and cultural direction and parental and caretaking direction that says, don't do that, do do this. And then when we violate that, when we break through and then they slam down on us and our lives depended on it, depended on their caretaking and their love, then suddenly we learn, oh my God, I better stay in this box that makes everybody else happy. And our full power comes when we can break out of that. And our full power as leaders comes when we're able to help other people break out of that. And we're all collectively able to break out of that together. And so it, it's, it's almost a learned behavior to stop feeling. Hmm. And we have to relearn feeling. We have to be re-willing to feel things and recognize that feeling the wrath of someone when we were two might actually have been life-threatening, but it is no longer life-threatening. And the having those small experiences that go, wow, you know what? The waiter wasn't so happy with me, right? But I'm not actually codependent on my waiter, so I'm actually okay. And it might go from the waiter to my friend, to my boss, to the board, to whoever, but but I can, I can withstand that 
and not detach myself from them and not detach myself from what I feel. When we detach ourselves from feeling, the, the, the problem still exists. We're repressing it and it ends up leaking out in insidious ways, which is the, the you know, working definition of passive aggressive behavior. So you know, if we really want to be uh, powerful in our leadership, then yeah, we have to build it. And it's not binary at all. We had it when we were born and it's about relearning it and refining it and taking little steps, each one that builds on the next so that eventually we can take those big risks and whatever happens with them, it doesn't knock us down. Do you have maybe a story or an example from the book or from your work of someone who went from not having emotional courage or not having sufficient emotional courage to then developing it and what the difference was and maybe, you know, an outcome? Yeah, I mean, you know, we, some of this, we experimented with all of these ideas over, uh, uh, you know, a few years of running a leadership intensive program, a program that, that I ran that uh, was really focused on building people's emotional courage. And partly we did it because we wanted to measure you know, what kinds of results, like if, when you build your emotional courage, does it make a difference in your leadership? And the answer is unequivocally yes, right? You, you, the, on any, any marker that we asked on, uh, you know, in terms of how other people viewed their leadership, in terms of their ability to accomplish things, in terms of even things like promotions, and uh, th that it made a difference. It, it improves your capacity to act powerfully and successfully in the world. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I just, I remember there's just one particular person that I remember who was at the leadership intensive and literally, I don't even know if I tell this story in the book, but, you know, literally halfway through, he was physically nauseous. Like he just, it was just like, it was, he was at being asked to do scary things that were not particularly scary to other people, right? Because this is a thing about how you feel and the fear of what you might be feeling it's incredibly personal. So what scares you is not going to be the same thing as what scares someone else. And, you know, it's why, you know, you hear that people, people, quote unquote, fear public speaking more than death, you know, but I kind of like it, right? It's not, you know, it's not something that I fear. So different people fear different things. But he was, you know, kind of wickedly afraid of, of, you know, showing up, actually of, of showing up in even like a touchy-feely way, like of expressing his emotions was something he was detached from and, and very scared about. And, you know, this was over the course of four days. It wasn't forever. But he really, you know, grew tremendously in his ability to where he was able to sort of stand up on stage, which is what we did in the group, and begin to sort of express some vulnerability in some of the ways that he was feeling, which, you know, two days beforehand would have been unthinkable. And, and then the question is, how does everybody feel about him when he expresses this, that he was af afraid would represent weakness and that they wouldn't like him anymore? He would become unlikable, right? But, you know, here's the thing. When you are open and in touch with your feelings and you're able to express that vulnerability, you know, you know this, that is when you are most likable. That is when people are most attracted to you, right? Because you need to be incredibly strong to express weakness without losing yourself, right? And the people who can't express weakness are not strong. They're not strong enough, right, to be able to uh, expose something that they're not great at without losing themselves so they don't expose it. So his ability to eventually do that in front of a lot of people drew everybody to him. And it was really, really like a beautiful example. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's, it makes you trustworthy. Exactly. Right, that, that you're, you're, okay, so now I know what you've been hiding. And right. it's, the same, it's, probably, it's probably the same thing I've been hiding. And now maybe, you know, as a leader, especially you, we've seen the effect of if, if a person in a position of authority, whether it's, um, you know, sort of line based on, a, on an org chart or just by virtue of their, their knowledge or expertise or resources, when, when someone does that, it can create concentric ripples throughout the whole organization, right? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, the, the point of trustworthiness is a great point because, you know, everybody, the, the thing that you're most afraid of exposing Everybody already knows. <laughs> like, like everybody already sees it. They know about it. They're almost always talking about it, but just not with you, right? Because it's not so safe to talk about it with you because they know that you can't really handle it. 
So when you can really handle it, nothing becomes off limits. But it's you're not exposing something that no one else knows. You're allowing everybody to breathe a sigh of relief to say it's on the table. And now I can trust this person because, you know, we don't have to go behind their back to say anything because we know they can handle it. Great. So one, one final question, which is it looks like the, you, you constructed the book not just to be a bunch of interesting stories or inspiration, but to really be a field manual for, for people to actually change, sort of as, as if you, you know, said, I, I'm going to mail myself to you as a coach through this book. Can you talk a little bit about the, the structural choices you made in crafting the, the work? Yeah, yeah. I it, and, and I love that you're asking that because it's really important to me that, you know, like I want this book to be entertaining and interesting and engaging for people. And, and I've been hearing that it is uh, to the sort of early readers who we've given it to. Um, and it's really important to me that you one can leave this book with changes, right? Having grown, so I, I, it's really like laddered. So the first thing is it starts with some, you know, conversation up front as to why this is important and kind of the sort of proof that we have that it actually makes a difference. And then there's an assessment, and the assessment you can get to on our website also. So you can take the same assessment on our website, and the assessments at the beginning of the book. And the assessment asks a, a series of questions that helps you figure out where are my strengths and weaknesses in terms of confidence and self, connection to others, commitment to purpose, and and emotional courage. And each question relates to a chapter in the book. So on a basic level, you can look through the assessment. You, at the beginning of the book, you could take the assessment and anything you answer no to, right? Yes, if you feel strong in this area. No, if you feel weak in this area or you want to get stronger. Anything you go no to, you can go right to that chapter, right? And, and every chapter has stories to it, but also has instruction and guidance to it. So hopefully it's very interesting to read, but it also lets you take a stepwise approach to growing this muscle. I, you could go anywhere in the book that you want to, but I would suggest you start from the confidence and self and build your way through it. And you can only focus on the chapters that you think you need or you can read them all. But it's about building through step by step a process. It's a very specific process so that you emerge from the end having gained that confidence and self connection to others, commitment to purpose and, and emotional courage. And the way that the book is also structured is not just so that you're learning the skills in a vacuum. While you're doing it, you're building what you need to build with your team, with the people that you really need to build it. So connection to others isn't in the abstract. It's connecting to the people you care about most, or it's connecting to your team, or your employees, or your bosses, or whoever it is that you need, you know, the people you have to influence without authority. It's, it's, con you know, it's, it's actually doing this work, collecting feedback from people. It's doing the work that not only teaches you, but builds around you the container that allows you to then have already achieved what you would set out to achieve if you were just learning this stuff in a room. Mm -hmm. Right. And I guess that somebody could, you know, wave the book around a little bit and say, like, this is my excuse. This is why I'm doing this hard thing. You know, I've got an assignment from, from a book and it can kind of, you know, g give you a, a way to to have these hard conversations where someone else is kind of giving you permission or forcing you to. I mean, one of the things that we've talked about is, is having your whole team read the book, right? Because if everybody, you know, every, or the organization read the book, because it, it's very clear that I'm trying to impact individuals, and it's also very clear that I'm trying to impact organizations, that I believe so deeply that if we all collectively show up with emotional courage, the willingness to connect with each other and be confident and commit to something bigger than all of us, that our organizations will be stellar. And so I, I care a lot about individuals and I care a lot about what we're trying to achieve in organizations. I believe in organizations. And so if, if, you know, if this book, if everybody's reading it, like I, I want the people around me to read this book. The, one of the reasons I wrote the book and I say it in this book in Leading with Emotional Courage is I wrote this because I want to live in a world in which people live like this, in which people are direct with me and caring at the same time. That's the world I want to live in. So I want everybody I come in contact with reading this book and I want everyone I work with to read the book and I want the organizations to read the book. And I know this sound, will sound to some people like I'm doing like a hard sell on saying everybody buy my book, but I really believe 
that if the, you know, it's like a fax machine. If one person has a fax machine, it's much harder to use it. If two people, you could use it. But if everybody is using this language, I want to start a movement. I want to start a movement where people are willing to feel what they need to feel to do what's important to them. And it's important together to collectively move forward in something. I want to live in that world. So I want teams to read this book. I want organizations to read this book. And I want, you know, I, I want us to show up in this way. And, and knowing you, I'm guessing that saying that just now that you want everybody to read this book takes emotional courage. <laughs> you're, you're right. You're absolutely, I mean, that's absolutely true. Uh, and I'm, I'm learning to say that because people are telling me like, if that's what you want, you have to say it. You can't just shy away from saying it because you're worried that you'll come off as salesy, which is of course what I worry about. So you know me well enough to know that <laughs> it's really true, but I really want it. I really want it. So, so there, there you go. I'm sweating a little bit and you can, if you're watching this on video, you can see that, but that's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, is there any questions that the host of the Bregman leadership podcast would like to ask today's guest? No, nah, this was great. I really think, you know, it was super, super fun. I really appreciate being on the Bregman leadership podcast. <laughs> Thank you for doing the interview, Howie. And, uh, and thank you to everybody for listening.